first speaker of today is Dr. Mike Osley. Um, he's an agronomist with uh, North Dakota State University Carrington Research Extension Center. Um, Dr. Mike Osley is the research agronomist. Um, his research includes a broad range of topics, including crop and livestock integration, cover crop, and herbicide interactions. Variety testing, weed management, and precision agriculture also round out his experience. I grew up near Northwood, North Dakota on a diversified crop and sheep operation. And then also Dr. Audrey Kalau, she was she is our host of the meeting today. Um, she is the plant pathologist here at the North Dakota State University um, Williston Research Extension Center. She obtained her BS in biology from the University of Minnesota um, in 2007 and worked in the commercial inoculant industry for three years prior to entering her graduate program. Audrey obtained her PhD in plant pathology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she studied root nodulating bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi. Audrey currently leads an applied research program focused on management of plant disease in durum, peas, lentils, chickpeas, and sugar beet, as well as nodulation and nitrogen fixation in chickpeas. Audrey currently co-leads the North Central IPM Center Pulse Crop Working Group and initiated and, overse and oversees the Growing Pulse Crops podcast series. And then Dr. Claire Keene, she's joining us online. Um, she is an assistant professor at North Dakota State University. She earned her PhD in agronomy from Penn State University from 2016 to 2021. She was the extension specialist in cropping systems here at the Williston Research Extension Center. While in Williston, Claire worked with local producers answering questions about weed control, saline soil reclamation, organic transition, and alternative cropping and marketing practices. She also conducted research on chickpea flax intercropping, salt tolerant alfalfa varieties, and the new perennial small grain Kernza. In July of 2021, Claire joined the NDSU Department of Plant Sciences in Fargo as an assistant professor of small grain and corn agronomy. So welcome all three of our speakers this morning. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to kind of kick things off here, and um, really before we get into the, the meat of the chickpea flax, I'm going to go over a little bit of a, an overview, uh, just to, of, of what we're saying when we're talking about intercropping, and then just some of the basic concepts uh, behind it. So for instance here, when we're talking about chickpea flax, um, this here's a picture I took right off the combine, uh, so you can see um, I think this is a combination that actually threshes out really well uh, when they're combined together. Uh, they got a few uh, a green foxtail in this particular sample, um, but uh, overall, uh, other than that, really nice clean samples. So what we're talking about uh, when we say intercropping, we mean we're going to plant and harvest two crops or more uh, at the same time. So uh, we're not talking about making extra passes across the field during the growing season, uh, but we are usually talking about uh, separating the harvested grain out after harvest um, in, in, in almost all cases, okay? So one extra step usually after harvest, but hopefully no extra steps during the growing season compared to growing a single crop, all right? And so uh, this is generally something that can be used um, to as a way to increase space efficiency. Uh, so um, I think particularly if somebody has a limited number of acres, uh, this might be particularly appealing because uh, you can make better use of, of, of each acre. Um, and just a few things to note that um, uh, so a lot of times you might have a lower cost of production um, simply because there aren't as many options as you have with one crop. Uh, because when you start talking about pest management programs, uh, oftentimes um, you don't have that many options. And so out of necessity, even, even if you plan on doing things uh, cheaper because of some synergies you might see, you might actually be forced into a uh, lower cost of production as well. Um, and then uh, when we're doing this, we do really need to also try to pair our maturities of our crops uh, to make the best use of the uh, reducing the number of operations in the field. Okay, so uh, here's a few pictures. Uh, from the Carrington Research Center of uh, this particular combination of the chickpea flax. We don't have the ability to alternate rows uh, on the equipment we have. Uh, so there's a lot of debates right off the bat on whether it's best to alternate rows or go same furrow on everything, right? And th I think there's a 
some advantages, disadvantages to either. But uh, first and foremost, uh, what we need to determine is what we, our equipment capabilities are, right? And so our equipment is not capable of alternating rows. So we put everything in the same furrow. Uh, and it's worked pretty well for us. Uh, we have our uh, flax alone, our chickpeas alone. And then here you can see we have um, a pretty nice flax stand. And if you look down the rows, you'll be able to see all these little chickpea plants uh, growing underneath uh, very healthily. <clears throat> Um, the one thing that um, I, I really noticed in particular in 2020 when we were doing this trial. So if you look down the rows, looking at trying to find all the chickpeas down here in the flax, uh, we also saw, all right, what's, what's the one big weakness on, on flax weed management, or at least for us? Uh, so you can use sulfentrazone ahead of flax, which is excellent. But the one big weakness of sulfentrazone is pigweeds, right? And so we almost always have pigweeds in our flax crop. All right, not, not too bad right here. Um, we use sulfentrazone in this combination. Uh, you can see a few uh, pigweeds popping up here out of where the chickpeas are, okay? Uh, but the thing I really noticed is when we had the chickpeas and the flax growing together, uh, we actually saw uh, a very noticeable uh, reduction in the in the uh, uh, size and stature of the pigweeds that were growing in here as well. So uh, definitely wanted to point that out as um, even though we do have maybe reduced options for herbicides uh, when we're doing mixed combinations, uh, we actually can see an added benefit of biological weed suppression, right? All right, so uh, a few other notes here. So I just want to point out that normally I do these presentations in, in a standard agronomy meeting. Uh, people aren't really um, necessarily looking to do something new. Uh, and so uh, I really try to pare people's expectations down because I think there's a lot of potential within our cropping. But uh, there are definitely some things we need to think about before I really encourage people to go down this route. So uh, number one uh, is this trade-off here. Uh, can overyielding uh, by having two crops growing together, uh, make up for the cost of separating grain and the cost of potentially two different seed lots. Okay, so that's uh, one of the first things we need to consider. Uh, very likely, we will be needing to um, desiccate uh, more so than if we had each crop alone. That's not always the case, uh, but I would say there's an increased chance that we're going to have to either desiccate or swap. Okay, we have less pest management options. Okay, and then some of the ones that are labeled for multiple crops in our systems are usually not quite as effective as the best ones you can use for either crop alone. But as I mentioned, uh, sometimes the, as long as you can keep it clean in the beginning, uh, usually the late season weed control is better uh, by, uh, by the biological weed suppression, all right? Uh, and then it also takes time to perfect a new system. I definitely do not tell people to go in and plant 100 acres your first year. Uh, this is something where we'd say, uh, maybe try five or 10 acres, see what you think, see how it works for you, right? Because this is not simplifying anything, right? By doing this, we're trying to get more production, but we're making it more complicated. And we need to figure some things out. It's gonna look different from farm to farm, right? And then also there's other basic management things we need to figure out too, such as, uh, you know, do we have to add fertilizer if we have a legume partner in our mix? All right, so uh, there's a lot of things that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, and a lot of things that you would need to figure out doing this on a farm as well. Okay. Um, I think this one might've been out close, but okay. So, just to give you an example, uh, one of the basic concepts, I think, in, in intercropping, it's not the only thing, right? Uh, but one of the major things that we probably will all talk about at some point today is this concept of overyielding, right? And uh, for those that need to calculate this on the farm, um, this is the basic concept. So let's say on a normal year, you grow a field pea crop and your, your yield is 50 bushels an acre, right? And you have a canola crop and your yield is 2,000 pounds an acre. 
Okay, now you do an inner crop. And just in this example here, uh, let's say you plant uh, two thirds of your normal field pea seeding rate, two thirds of your normal canola rates, and you might get 38 bushels instead of 50 and 1400 pounds instead of 2000, okay? So in this example, this is 100% of a normal pea crop, 100% of a normal canola crop. And down here, we've got 76% of a normal pea crop and 70% of a normal canola crop. So you add those together. And in this example, you would have a 46% increase in yield um, over either crop alone. Now that's pretty high. This is, I was just trying to use some easier numbers to work with here. We don't normally see almost a 50% yield increase, but 30% is uh, what I would consider an achievable target. All right, and you don't always get there either, but I think that's something to shoot for. Okay, and another way to say this is, uh, this is what we would call our LER, our land equivalency ratio. And in this example, this 50% increase, uh, we would write that out as uh, like a 1.46, 46% more yield than either crop on its own, okay? All right, so uh, I just wanted to bring an example of this here as we go. So uh, what does this mean? So in this, uh, this is an actual data set that we had. So we have um, this listed as our canola seeding rate first, and then our field pea seeding rate second. So <clears throat> I didn't list the yields here quite yet, but so we have 100% field pea yield, 100% canola yield. And this is what it looked like when we combined them. So when we added canola, uh, we got a pretty big reduction in our field pea production, okay? Uh, but the field peas did not affect our canola. Um, we saw a maximum of around 25% reduction in our canola yield, okay? So then you add those two together and we saw anywhere from a 10 to 23% increase in total yield. Now. Now for the downfall of the LER, it is not everything, right? Profit is what's gonna be the most attractive thing in the system, right? So what happens when we actually plug in the yield? So, uh, <clears throat> the average canola yield this year was actually 3,400 pounds. Fantastic canola year. Our field peas, we're only like 35 bushels an acre, all right? So we have our LER combined values here, 17, 16, 23% over yield. And you say, well, those look pretty close. But when you actually put the, the gross return, not, not net return, we add, when you compute your gross return, we actually see a very big discrepancy. So um, up here on the, on the upper right, this uh, column labeled field P, this would be like, if you were growing a field pea crop, what would happen when you add canola to it, all right? And so because the canola yield was really good, if we are a field pea grower adding canola, we're almost always coming out substantially ahead uh, because our field pea was only okay and our canola was fantastic that year, all right? This column will be if you're a canola grower and you wanted to add field pea to that mixture, right? From that perspective. In this case, uh, you're sometimes better off growing just canola economically, all right? There are a few times here, this particular mixture, we came out $100 a head by adding field peas to our canola because our canola yield was almost identical uh, to what our monocrop canola yield was. But here, this 20% reduction in canola yield resulted in a, a big swing uh, economically here because the field peas did not make up that difference uh, based on the price of each crop, okay? So LER is interesting. It gives us a good indicator of what our system is doing, but economically, it might tell a little bit different story. So I just wanted to bring that up, okay? So back to chickpea flax. Uh, why, why are we considering chickpea flax? And, um, you know, as, as you notice the program, uh, we really have two things we're talking about, field pea canola, chickpea flax, right? So why? All right, for chickpea flax, uh, we have two very different plant types, right? 
We have chickpeas and flax in completely different plant families. Uh, so very different architectures, very different ways they use nutrients, water, uh, different ways that they, they grow different architectures, they're using sunlight differently. And when you start talking about system efficiencies, your cropping system, that's a very, very big plus in the way that it's gonna be able to utilize resources, okay? Doesn't always mean it's gonna turn out in your favor. Just at least theoretically, this is a really good thing, all right? Um, uh, we've seen some increases in weed control. Uh, I think in some cases we're getting more yield per acre. And um, we're gonna talk quite a little bit about um, ascochytal blight coming up because we've seen some uh, really nice things from that perspective. So we're just kind of pausing mid-talk to briefly give an introduction to ascochyta blight. If you're not, if you're a chickpea producer, you're familiar with it, but if chickpea's new to you, you're not. So we just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page regarding this pathogen. If, you're, if you've not grown chickpea, I think it can be a little bit of a boogeyman. You've heard about it, it you know it's aggressive, it's kind of scary, um, but hopefully by the end of my slides, you'll kind of have an idea if you have an integrated disease management plan, it's not so bad. Well, it's bad, but you need to, you can manage it. All right, so it's a fungal pathogen. Um, you're probably familiar with ascochyta blight on lentils or ascochyta blight on peas. Um, just know that this is a different pathogen. It's specific to chickpea. So if you're adding chickpea into a pea lentil rotation, it's not going to increase your um, foliar ascochyta problems in lentil or pea. Um, it does affect all plant parts. So you can see lesions here on the pods, the stem, and the leaf, it forms these kind of really diagnostic bullseye pattern on the, on the plant. And that bullseye, those are little fungal structures. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it can develop really quickly, but you need kind of wet, cool conditions. A year like this year where it was really hot and really dry does really uh, reduce the amount of disease that you get. Um, this is an example. This is a, a fungicide trial that I had under irrigation. Uh, without this is uh, no no fungicides, um, and I'm inoculating it with with chickpea residue that has been overwintered somewhere. So I'm doing everything I can to get a lot of disease because that's my job. Um, and and so if you're not controlling it, it can be quite quite aggressive, and you can end up with complete yield loss. Um, but with this pathogen, you know, inter we want to talk about using intercropping and just know that's going to be one part of your management strategy if, if that's what you want to do. So let's talk about where this pathogen um, comes from, how it overwinters, and how it spreads within the crop because that's where the concept of intercropping is going to come in. So the red circle here, that's what's happening in season. Uh, you've got these lesions on your leaf and we'll talk about how they got there to begin with. But all these little dots within that lesion, these are called pycnidium, and they're full of, of spores called pycnidia. And <clears throat> what's important here is that this is, this is a cycle. So these, these are going to germinate and release spores under wet, humid conditions. And then rain and wind are going to spread them around. So the more rain you have, the more spread you get. And this can happen over and over and over and over again within the growing season. So the more lesions you have, the more canidia you have, and the more spread you have. So it's just important to keep that initial number of lesions low and get ahead of it. All right, so, so this is what it's going to be doing in season, across seasons. So you end up with these stem lesions, right? You're cutting it pretty low. Um, so you're going to be removing some of the pathogen, but it's going out the back of the combine too. So that's going to be your inoculum source along with the pathogen born on the seed. So if you have contaminated seed, uh, as that seed germinates, it can affect uh, seed germination. You're going to end up with some lesions probably earlier in the season than you would have otherwise. Uh, and again, then you start your cycles earlier, which you don't want. Um, and then if that residue is there, um, that's going to be really the main provider of inoculum. So all of our management strategies always have to do with the pathogen biology. And that's why I want you to understand uh, how this pathogen works within and across seasons. So our management strategies, uh, I talk about IPM a lot, just know that's integrated pest management. It just means throwing everything you can at the pathogen. So we'll start with our prevention, right? Seed testing, seed treatment, and crop rotation and then spacing out where you're planting your chickpea fields. 
right? If your neighbor had chickpea last year, don't plant chickpea right next to your neighbor's chickpea field. That will provide an inoculum source. Um, and same thing within your own land. Uh, there's, there's documented literature that increased row spacing will prevent the spread of that pathogen in your crop. So potentially that's where the intercropping comes in. You're increasing your plant spacing, but then you don't have a bunch of bare dirt where you're not getting any yield. Uh, variety selection, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you need to be on top of the pathogen out there scouting for it. This is not like peas or lentils, right? The fungicides are gonna start when you see the pathogen right away. Uh, you really do have to get ahead of it. And we'll talk about the fungicides as well. So this is a stacked approach and intercropping can definitely be a part of your approach. All right, so if you're new to chickpea, just know that you can get your seed tested. If you're running bin run seed, please test your seed. 0.3% um, is your threshold of whether you wanna plant that or not. So don't, don't plant chickpea without testing your seed. If you're buying chickpea seed, you should know what your ascocolyte blight levels are. Um, you can send it to the state seed lab in North Dakota, or you can send it to the, the uh, regional pulse crops diagnostic lab at Montana State. Um, just know it's got, there's gonna be a little bit of time to turn around, seven to 10 days, and no, we can't shorten that because that's how long it takes for the pathogen to grow. And then um, in terms of seed treatment, just make sure you're checking the label or checking our uh, field, um, field disease management guide and making sure it says ascochyta blight and also pythium. Pythium is also an important pathogen. So just make sure when you're getting your fungicides, you know those actives inc include control of these two pathogens and it should say. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about variety resistance. I've color coded these. These are two variety trials I've done over the past two years. Um, obviously yield has not been optimal in either of those years. And this year disease levels were really low, but even so we're able to distinguish the very susceptible chickpea varieties from the moderately susceptible chickpea varieties. And you definitely wanna go with the latter. So here we have, we're comparing CDC Frontier, CDC Leader, CDC Orion, Sawyer, Royal, and Sierra. There are some different seed sizes in there. So make sure you know what seed, class, seed size class you're in. Um, ND Crown, uh, I don't have on this slide. Uh, it is in our um, annual report this year for the Williston REC, but it kind of fell in with the leaders in the frontiers. So this is percent severity of ascochyta blight. The lines in blue kind of cluster together and the lines in red cluster together. That's just based on statistical analysis. So you see disease severity is higher in the Royal and the Sierra, and that results in a significant yield loss, even in a, in a, in a, a year where we have less disease. So making sure you're not growing a variety that is highly susceptible. But know that, you know, in the case of um, chickpea production in Australia, they did have their disease resistance, which was quite strong in their, their chickpea varieties there, overcome. It took about 10 years, but their variety resistance was overcome. And that's just because the pathogen wasn't being controlled in other ways as well. So that's why I keep harping on stacking your disease management approach, because there's cases where we don't have that approach anymore in other countries. And I don't want that to be where we end up. All right, so fungicides. Uh, there's a lot of old literature out there that talks about using strobilurins for the control of ascochyta blight. Resistance was detected at kind of in the mid, uh, you know, 2008, 2007 in Canada. It's been documented here in North Dakota. So know that you cannot use strobilurins for control of ascochyta blight in chickpea. They are not effective. The pathogen is resistant. Um, so products where you've got that in the tank mix too, just know you're not getting anything from that. Um, so we're using the FRAC3 and the FRAC7. A lot of the products are combo products, but they have both of those groups. Just if you're applying more than one application in the season, make sure you're rotating those. And then um, Michael Bunch and I have been working on tank mixes with chlorothalonil. Um, tank mixing chlorothalonil with proline results in really, really excellent disease control right now. And the bonus of that chlorothalonil is that it's a multi-site mode of action. And we're helping, again, control the pathogen overcoming these products so that we can have them available to us for a longer period of time. You know, so far, we don't have resistance to these, but it's really important that we take care of these products. We're rotating and we're stacking these other approaches like intercropping so we don't get a highly aggressive pathogen that we can't control. So first timing is going to vary based on your growing season. When do you see that disease occur in the field? Just keep an eye on it. 
Um, you know, if you don't see it up until flowering, your earliest application could be at early flowering. Um, and then the window is 10 to 14 days. Usually in my research trials, I'll do the end of that window, the 14 days. And we have a pretty short growing season some years. I've, I've combined chickpeas mid-August some years, but October other years, so it, it can vary. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're on a mid-August harvest time frame, you know, you might end up in a really bad year two to three applications here in the Williston area. Um, but usually um, I do around two in my disease trials, I've done up to four. Uh, but again, that the number of applications you're going to make is dependent on the level of disease in your field, what the weather looks like. You know, if you've got a big thunderstorm coming and you're at the end of your 14 day window, spray ahead of it. Right. But if weather's hot and dry, maybe you can stretch it out a little bit. Just keep an eye on it. So it's just going to be really weather dependent. And again, dependent on the level of disease in your field, which you've hopefully minimized through checking your seed, growing a resistant variety, good crop rotation and intercropping. All right. So Mike's going to start us off with some of the data they've collected on the intercrop mixes. Yeah, thanks. All right. So um, here's some examples of um, what we've been able to um, work with with um, the chickpea flax. So Carrington, just to preface, is not a chickpea growing region. <laughs> uh, it's never something I would tell somebody to go, yeah, you should be growing chickpeas out here. Uh, we do not have an environment for that. Uh, we do have a chickpea variety trial, but uh, sometimes I don't know if five fungicide applications would be enough to optimally manage chickpea alone, okay? So just throwing that out there. <clears throat> so we do test chickpeas, but nobody really grows them, okay, in our region. Now, here we uh, did a trial um, over a couple of years, um, and uh, Williston did a, a similar one here with Justin Jacobs. Um, we're looking at different chickpea and flax seeding rates uh, and whether we applied fungicide or no fungicide. Now, when we applied fungicide here, uh, we were, this would be um, uh, um, two times, so two fungicide applications uh, versus none at all. All right, uh, so there's um, some things here, uh, again, different seeding rates. Uh, so, um, uh, here we have the chickpea seeding rate on the left and then the flax seeding rate on the right. And as we go across our, our table, um, maybe we'll just start with the Ascochida information, the second column uh, in the yellow here. So with no fungicide and chickpeas alone, uh, we had around 50% uh, incidence in um, Ascochita. This was measured mid, mid season. Um, uh, or actually, you have two columns here. So measured twice in the middle of the season. Okay. Why don't we go to the green one? The green one, um, I think, is a little bit more interesting. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> in this case, we had 60% incidence uh, a little bit later here in early August. Okay. And so now our chickpea alone with two fungicide applications, we're able to cut that ascochita incidence down by about half. So about half the amount of ascochita uh, in our plots, all right? Now, no fungicide, but with different rates of flax mixed in with our chickpeas, look at these different um, incidences of ascochita, and you look at those numbers compared to Chickpea alone with fungicide. So chickpea flax, no fungicide at the bottom. Chickpea alone at the top with fungicide. The numbers are very comparable, right? Very comparable. All right, now we look at the top. Fungicide with intercropping. So essentially what, just what uh, Audrey was talking about layering. So we have two mechanisms of aspicated control and we reduce our ascochita substantially more, all right? So fungicide, in this case, fungicide and intercropping provided similar amounts of control. You do both. We had an even further reduction than either, than either control method alone. So uh, very fantastic news there. Now, uh, we haven't been able to replicate quite that same level of efficiency 
since then. So this isn't something you should count on, uh, but it's something that may be possible uh, in some cases, okay? So again, uh, just to throw those numbers out here, uh, a little more simplified, if you uh, take the, uh, and I have the yields next to it as well, the final yields in both years here. So this year we went from 60 down to roughly 30 uh, with these two control methods, intercropping and fungicide. Um, and then we reduced it even further with both. Now in 2020, uh, we saw, again, um, not quite as much ascochyta with our chickpea alone, with no fungicide, all right? Uh, once again, we saw a pretty similar amount of uh, reduction, whether we were intercropping or just using fungicides in our chickpeas, okay? But the difference is uh, when we did both fungicide and intercropping, uh, we didn't see that further step down. We saw maybe a slight reduction in ascochyta with both, but it wasn't nearly as uh, pronounced as the year before. Right now, again, um, the uh, that's not the end of the story here. All right, this year our flax did really well. Our chickpeas didn't do so well, and so with a very aggressive flax crop and and conditions only, you know, not very great for chickpeas, uh, we had huge yield reductions here in our chickpeas. So even though we had these amazing drop downs in ascochyta control. Um, this year, this might have been financially feasible, but most of the time when flex prices are more normal, uh, this would probably be a bad thing for your system, right? All right, in uh, 2020, uh, we had uh, much better chickpea yields um, and flax yields were uh, quite a bit lower. Uh, so we still saw a fair amount of reduction in um, our chickpea yield, um, not quite as much, so, Depending on the prices again, we'll see. Now, the one thing we've learned is that uh, when we were doing these trials, we didn't, really didn't have a low enough flax rate. Uh, most of the time, the flax was just too competitive with the chickpeas. And we saw really what well, I consider a lot of times unacceptable chickpea yield loss. Because most of the time, that's gonna be the economic driver, right? All right, here's a little bit more balanced year where both the the chickpeas did really well, and the flax did actually uh, quite well as well. So it wasn't always one way or the other. Uh, in 2018, we had a year where, where we had um, um, kind of both. But nonetheless, uh, because the flax, we, we really weren't testing low enough fl uh, flax rates in this year either. Um, and we still saw most likely uh, unacceptable yield loss, because if you can market over three uh, 3,000 pounds of chickpea uh, when you're going on its own, uh, odds are you're gonna be pretty happy with that. So uh, once again, uh, very good for asking blights, um, but I think we need to be really careful, at least in Carrington area with the uh, rate of flex that we're using. So uh, to summarize what we've been going through here, um, so, in Carrington, without any control measures, uh, we might, we've been expecting 50 to 60% incidence of Uh Some years it's higher than that. This is what the medium resistor, the, one of the less susceptible varieties. So we have a little bit of genetic resistance built in there already too. So 50 to 60% incidence of infection. Uh, we were able to cut that down by about half through either of these practices or down to about 75% reduction by stacking and best case scenario, okay? All right. Um, and uh, I think this was specific to uh, 2019. Uh, our monocrop chickpea um, had an 80% reduction in yield without our fungicide. Um, when we were intercropping our chickpea, uh, we were able to gain 30% back uh, with, you know, without applying any other fungicides. So, you know, there's a, Definitely an intrinsic value to having that intercrop growing um, there with your uh, chickpeas. So uh, the one thing I didn't show here, because it's a pretty boring graph, but uh, we actually saw 100% control of white mold in the one year that we had a, a big white mold outbreak in our chickpeas. So we had any amount of flax in the plot, we had zero white mold. If we had just chickpeas, we had substantial white mold. Okay, <laughs> that, so it's a pretty boring graph. But, uh, and then of course, my biggest takeaway is that um, I think 
in our area, 10 pounds an acre of flax is the most I would consider ever putting in the system, okay? Uh, maybe we need to go even less than that. And uh, I think we we'll turn it over to Claire at this point. Alrighty, hello everybody. Um, Claire Keen, and <laughs> sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, hopefully some of you recognize me from out in my, from my time out in Williston. Um, been here in Fargo the last few months and still adjusting to the new job, but very happy to be able to share with you some data from Williston. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two trials uh, that I conducted in 2018 and 2020 at the Williston Research Extension Center dryland farm. Uh, so these were not done under irrigation. And um, I think that was a nice transition from Mike um, in those seeding rates of flax, because what was I, I was interested, um, you know, oh gosh, three years ago now, um, when starting to do this is, you know, could I identify a flax seeding rate that reduced the ascochyta blight uh, without reducing chickpea yield? So that was my goal. Um, in both years, I used CDC Orion chickpea, which is a Kabuli type, and then CDC glass flax. And uh, the treatments that I used, I guess, I'll, can you see the mouse if I move it on the screen? Yep, you're good. Okay, great. So I, I had my uh, treatments ranging from monocrop chickpea to chickpea with five pounds of flax, 10, 15, 20, 40 pounds of flax, and then a monocrop flax of 40 pounds per acre as a check. Um, in percent, Mike had presented um, his data in terms of a percent of that full seeding rate. So five pounds of flax compared to 40 pounds is 12 and a half percent. So this is 12 and a half percent to the monocrop. 25%, 37.5%, 50%, percent, and 100%. So just to give you um, that continuity there. So I did have some of these lower rates included in my trials. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, planting configurations and this will this will have implications when we get into the yield, uh, but I did use different planters in the two years of these studies. So in 2018, we used an old single row planter with 10 inch spacing. And on that single row planter, there's a different funnel essentially for each row. And so I would dump, you know, packet of flax, packet of chickpea, packet of flax, packet of chickpea um, in the intercrop plots or just all chickpea or flax envelopes um, for the monocrops. So what that ended up looking like was a four row plot of chickpea with the monocrop. Uh, as I mentioned, flax, chickpea, flax with the intercrop plot, and then monocrop flax, all flax. Um, and that seeding rate of the monocrop chickpea was about 120 pounds per acre. I was targeting that four plants uh, per foot of row. So seeding it at about four to five seeds per foot. Um, I didn't, uh, something that it kind of dawned on me like after I planted the trial, this did result in half as many chickpea plants present in the intercrop plots as the monocrop because I didn't double that seeding rate of chickpea in the intercrop. So functionally the seeding rate in my 2018 trial was 120 pounds uh, per acre of chickpea in the monocrop, but then 60 pounds per acre of chickpea with those different rates of flax in the intercrop and then the monocrop at 40 pounds. And so just a picture of that, you um, can see flax, chickpea, flax, chickpea. So that four row plot in alternating rows. In 2020, we used a cone seeder and that cone seeder, uh, like we use in many of our variety trials, is designed to be able to do, um, you know, different varieties of the same crop plot to plot. And so it's, um, a six row cedar with eight inch spacing. So looking at the monocrop flax, that's what normally gets planted out of this planter is um, you have your seeding rate and you just put it down the, the cone cedar and, and away you go. Uh, but to do the chickpea, we actually put it in the fertilizer box. So the chickpea was coming out of the banded fertilizer tubes. And so my monocrop chickpea plots were three rows of chickpea um, at a 15 inch spacing. The intercrops, um, 
that chickpea was still coming out in that 15 inch spacing, but then the eight inch spacing of uh, the flax rows on top of it. And then again, that monocrop flax was uh, six rows of flax at an eight inch spacing. The monocrop chickpea rate was 120 pounds per acre again, uh, but because of this different planter configuration, I was able to keep the chickpea seeding rate consistent between the monocrop and the inner crops in 2020. And again, um, you know, when we get to yield, um, I think there's something interesting there to, to mention with that. So 2020, a picture of those plots. Um, there's an outer row of flax, a row of chickpea, two rows of flax between the next row of chickpea, again, two rows of flax, chickpea, and then an outer row of flax. So uh, different configurations between 2018 and 2020. So for effects on ASCO kite blight in 2018, um, again, just remembering that there were half as many chickpea plants in the inner crops as the monocrop. Um, I looked at incidence as the number of chickpea plants out of 10 with ascochytoblite lesions present, so just presence or absence from 10 plants randomly selected in the plot. And then severity used a 0 to 10 scale, oh, sorry about that, uh, with no lesions being 0 and a rating of 10, meaning many lesions present throughout the canopy, including on upper leaves and pods. And so in 2018, um, there were significant differences in Ascochyta incidents um, at the July 17th sampling date where monocrop chickpea had higher incidence than uh, intercropping with chickpea and flax, um, but noting that even though it was statistically similar, um, that monocrop chickpea incidence of Ascochyta was higher than all of the uh, intercrop combinations. And on July 31st, the severity rating, again, um, with severity being on a zero to 10 scale, um, that monocrop chickpea plot was rated at, a, rated at 7.3, uh, which was significantly different from any of the intercrop rates of 10, 15, 20, and 40 pounds of flax. And then that five pounds of flax being similar to both the monocrop and those higher rates of flax. And so there wasn't, um, you know, obviously a statistical difference at every sampling date. Um, but I do note that, you know, even with um, severity and incidence of July 17th and 31st, again, that trend of the monocrop chickpea having the highest rating, uh, both in terms of severity and incidence is there. And now 2018 um, was a pretty wet year for us out at the Williston REC. Um, we had approximately 9.2 inches of rain between May and August, so certainly one of the better rainfall years we've had um, in the last, last five. And then uh, we did spray the whole trial with fungicide twice, so on June 25th and July 12th. So all of these treatments did have two applications of foliar fungicides. Uh, now in 2020, so again, just reminding you that there's the same density of chickpea plants in the monocrop and the intercrop in this year. I also changed my scales <laughs> um, with some input from plant pathologists. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, number of chickpea plants out of 20 with ascochyta lesions present. So again, that presence absence. Um, and then the severity of a one to nine, one to nine scale. Um, I learned that that's a more typical scale in uh, plant pathology. So we went with that. So one meaning no lesions and nine, again, many lesions present um, throughout the canopy and then also with wilting or dead plants present. And so in 2020, uh, we did these ratings, July 1, July 9, July 24. And the only time we saw a statistically significant difference was July 24, where on the incidence, 15, approximately 15 out of 20 chickpea plants checked um, had ascochyta lesions present. Uh, which was different from with 10 pounds of flax, roughly 11 and 11 plants with that um, 20 pounds of flax. Um, so not a lot of statistical differences in 2020. However, again, that trend, so on July 1st, of more plants in the monocrop chickpea um, plots having ascochyta present than the intercrop plots, that was, that was true at July 1. 
in July 9, um, and then severity. Um, these severity ratings just were not very high in 2020, which makes sense in light of the, the drought that we had. So still that trend of the monocrop chickpea having a more, um, you know, more severe nature of that infestation. But again, relative to 2018, these are pretty low numbers. Um, I'll just go back quick. You know, so reminder in 2018, looking at a 10 plants, by the end of July, even with two fungicide applications, I was seeing those monocrop uh, plots, you know, 10 out of 10 plants having ascochyta present. Um, but then you go to 2020 and out of 20 plants, you know, 15 out of 20 in the monocrop um, and down around, you know, 11 out of 20 plants in the higher rates of flax in our crop. So very different years in terms of moisture. Um, but I think that that still shows that one in a dry year, you can still have ascochyta. Um, but then two, intercropping, while it may not provide as, as high a degree as of control as, as in a wetter year, um, it's still doing something. Uh, and again, just pointing out, so in 2020, the growing season rainfall was approximately 4.3 inches, so half, half of what it was in 2018. And again, this whole trial did receive uh, fungicide uh, three times in 2020. Um, something uh, Mike mentioned in his preface that intercropping might increase the need for desiccation. And I do think that's true, especially with the P uh, canola combination that'll get talked about later. Um, but just kind of an interesting side note um, in my conversations with Lena Shaw and some other growers in Canada, you know, they had noticed that they felt that intercropping chickpea and flax generally provided a benefit to chickpea dry down, that that chickpea, or sorry, having the flax with the chickpea just encouraged the chickpea to, um, to shut down you know, late summer, like you want it to, and start drying down rather than staying green and, and continuing to flower. And so I did dry down ratings each year. And so in 2018, uh, went out about every 10 days and rated the plots for the percent of chickpea plants with mature color. And there were significant differences um, at each of those dates. Again, this was in a, a pretty wet year. Um, and then in 2020, that dry down happened with the drought, um, certainly much more quickly. Um, but again, the, the trend of those intercropped uh, plots drying down the chickpea faster uh, really held true. And I feel like to me, an, an interesting um, observation in 2018, again, um, a pretty wet growing season, you know, you start to see the spread really widen, you know, functionally the difference between 0% of your chickpea plants with mature color on August 2nd. And, um, oh, I keep losing my cursor. There we go. And 5%, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Right. And then the difference between 15% and 30%, you know, that spread starts to widen. But then by the time we get to August 24th, um, seeing, you know, pure chickpea and chickpea with five pounds of flax down at the 60, 65% mature color. Um, but the chickpea with 20 and 40 pounds up at 80%, that's a pretty big difference. You know, that might be close to that tipping point of if you were going to go out and desiccate um, to do that um, and be able to, to harvest those chickpeas potentially a week or two earlier uh, than you otherwise might have, I think is really important. Um, and then in 2020, just with that very dry summer, um, you know, that chickpea was drank down much more quickly. August 4th, we were already at 30% mature color in the monocrop. Um, compared to about 56% with the 40 pounds of flax. Uh, so just that intercropping does seem to push, push that chick, chickpea dry down uh, more quickly. And again, you know, maybe at the production scale, I'd say we don't, we don't have good data on that yet. Um, but if this is a way that a grower could get into that field earlier to harvest those chickpeas, prevent it from getting rained on, next week or two weeks from now. I think that's where there's, there's some real potential with this. Uh, for some photos, so these are from August 14th of 2018. So monocrop chickpea here on the left. Um, and I'll just point out, so there's still quite a few, you know, dark green, healthy leaves doing, doing photosynthesis. And if you see a dead plant or, you know, what you might think of as mature color in that monocrop plant, um, I would say in nine out of 10 cases, 
those plants aren't mature color because they naturally senesced. It's because Ascochyta uh, killed them, you know, a, a week or more ago. And so that's what you're seeing in the monocrop chickpea plants when you see brown. Um, with the 10 pounds of flax, so those chickpea rows are here and here, and then chickpea with 40 pounds of flax on the far right. Um, those chickpea plants just have many fewer lush green leaves. They're much more yellow. And so that's what I was capturing with those ratings um, on the earlier slide. From 2020, again, with a drought year, um, August 4th. So chickpea is definitely drying down uh, more quickly in 2020 than they did in uh, 2018. Um, but again, just looking at those monocrop chickpea rows, uh, more green present there with five pounds of flax, those chickpea rows are starting to get lost in the yellow flax. And then at that 20 pound rate of flax, um, I'd say the chickpea leaves are getting pretty hard to pick out from the um, flax stems as they're all um, turning yellow pretty quickly. Um, this is a photo taken at harvest of 2018. So again, these are small plots. Um, I did not need to desiccate in either 2018 or 2020 to be able to harvest these. Um, so after that last set of ratings, we waited another five days or so and went out and with the small plot combine, it worked. Uh, there really wasn't much green material. It was pretty clean in terms of weeds. Uh, we did use Spartan ahead of planting um, and that did a, a nice job in these fields. So weeds, certainly if you have green weeds out there, that could be an issue that needs desiccation. Um, and I'd say, you know, it's certainly too soon to say whether you can get away with desic without desiccation in the system, um, but there might be years in which that's possible. Um, but again, something to, to play with at a field scale if you're a grower uh, considering this. Um, here's a shot of uh, my inner crop straight out of the combine. Um, it, to me, I mean, it did look pretty good. Certainly we had a lot of pieces of chickpea pods and straw, um, but those separated out very easily with the, the clipper cleaners that we have at the WREC. So now in terms of yields. Um, so in 2018, uh, we, I did not see over yielding in any year. So just to put that out there, um, but I do think there were some interesting things happening with um, the with both the chickpeas and the flax in these different yields. So in 2018, um, the monocrop chickpea did yield the most um, the most chickpea of all the treatments, uh, but then certainly the most total poundage of uh, of grain coming out of the field. So the different letters on these uh, light beige bars indicate um, statistical differences in the chickpea yield. So monocrop chickpea, five, 10 and 15 pounds of flax. It did step down from the monocrop chickpea. We went from about 1700 pounds uh, per acre down to about 1100 pounds, um, but that was statistically similar to the monocrop. Uh, but then also the lower yields of chickpea when it was intercropped with 20 and 40 pounds of flax. And so down there, it was roughly 850 and 620 pounds of chickpea at these higher intercrops. And we did see the flax uh, yield stay kind of similar at those uh, lower rates of intercropping, but then step up at the, the higher seeding rates. And something, again, just to remind you about like that planting configuration, um, I didn't have plant stand counts, unfortunately, so I don't, I don't know the mechanism at play here, but I do think it's interesting that even though we had half as many chickpea plants in these inner crops, because there were just two rows of chickpea compared to four rows over here, um, we were getting about two thirds of the chickpea yield as the monocrop. So we were getting two thirds the yield with half the seeding rate. So I, you know, had I had I the uh, foresight back in 2018 when I was planning this to put in the other set of plots with the same number of chickpea plants in those two rows, um, I'm really curious to know what that would have done. But but I think that shows maybe there's some potential for overyielding, you know, at the plant level potentially. Maybe with that lower density of chickpea there, they responded by um, getting bigger, producing more pods, you know. But I didn't collect that data, so I'm not sure. 
um, in 2020, so looking at 2020, um, definitely saw the potential for flax to be much more competitive in a dry year than a wet year. I think that's the take home of 2020. So overall, our yields were lower. The monocrop chickpea yielded just a little bit over a thousand pounds per acre. And then it did step down um, as the flax seeding rate increased. So even five pounds per acre of flax uh, did decrease it to about 700 pounds of chickpea. Um, and so, so there, I think the take home message is if we're in a real dry situation, even a very low rate of flax can reduce chickpea yield. But then just, you know, looking at maybe the bright side and certainly a bright side in a year where flax is worth $30 a bushel, um, the flax did really, really well. I had to, you know, kind of do a double take when I, when I was thinking about it. But so our monocrop flax between 2018 and 2020, um, 780 pounds in a year with nine inches of rain, or sorry, um, about 800, 800 pounds per acre um, in a monocrop flax with nine inches of rain in the growing season uh, compared to 780 pounds. So very, very comparable. And excuse me, and then that flax, again, just showing its drought hardiness, really um, stepping up in yield uh, as its seeding rate was increased. And I just noted that between the chickpea intercropped with flax at the 40 pound rate uh, between 2018 and 2020, um, really just kind of flip flopped, which I thought was interesting. So, okay, and so I'll wrap it up here. Um, so for the optimal seeding rate of flax, that question, you know, did we find something that can reduce ascochyta blight, but then also maintain chickpea yield? Um, I think that 10 to 15 pounds of flax appears to be kind of that sweet spot to balance um, reducing ascochyta pressure with maintaining chickpea yield. However, in a dry year, that could certainly um, reduce the chickpea yield. Five pounds of flax wasn't enough to consistently reduce ascochyta, while 20 pounds did consistently reduce chickpea yield compared to the monocrop. The rate of chickpea dry down, if that's something you're interested in, did seem to be a little bit more consistent, the 15 pound rate of flax and higher. Uh, but we do need growers to test if this holds true at a production scale. And then uh, finally, you know, again, flax is much more competitive with chickpea in a dry year. So just something certainly in the western part of the state or eastern Montana, uh, we need to keep in mind if, um, if that's what the growing season is, is like. Uh, so with that, um, we will um, take any questions you have. Uh, myself, Mike, and Audrey are all available for your questions. Well, Claire, I'll kick it up with a question of my own, if you don't mind. So <laughs> if I'm interpreting this correctly, in the 2018 trials, the row spacing between chickpea um, was all the same you know, across your, your intercrop and monocrop, but in, but in 2020, your, your row spacing in your monocrop was greater, right? You have, you had an increased row spacing. Do you think that that could have played a role in the reduction in disease you saw in and the less the, the reduced difference you saw essentially between that monocrop and the intercrop, given that you did have a, a wide row spacing in your monocrop chickpea? Right. So there were 15 inches between chickpea um, rows in 2020, where there, whereas there was only 10 inches between rows in 2018. Um, but then also I'd say two confounding factors, um, two rows of flax between those two rows of chickpea in 2020 versus only one row of flax between the rows of chickpea in 2018. And then throw on top of it just a much hotter and drier growing season. Um, so I think back to your question, yes, uh, that wider row spacing um, could could be one of the factors why just overall severity incidence, severity and incidence ratings were less in 2020 than 2018. Um, you know, but but I guess I don't I don't have a real confidence in whether I would attribute the overall lower ratings to that different planting configuration or just to that much drier uh, growing growing season. Yeah, I'm just thinking maybe you would have seen a bigger difference between the treatments in 2020 if you had been on like an eight inch row spacing for the monocrop compared mm -hmm. to it goes chickpea flax, chickpea flax and eight inches. 
Sure. Either way you saw it, that's so interesting. Okay, so we've got a question, looks like, in the chat. Uh, could you talk about any potential benefits or disadvantages to planting and alternating rows versus planting both crops together in the same row? Uh, did either of you want to take that? Have to be you guys. <laughs> and, and I think uh, later on, Lana uh, Shaw has some information that'll help with that too. But I think Claire, you had some, you had, you had a more of a comparison for this, didn't you? I had tried. Um, so it, it ended up being a, a trial that didn't work out. In 2018, I also tried planting some long strips of chickpea and flax in either same rows or alternating rows. Um, actually right next door to those plots that you saw pictures of um, to with the goal of tracking Ascochyta over the season and seeing if the mixed row versus the alternating rows made a difference. And unfortunately we planted that might've been a week to 10 days later. I don't really recall, um, but we had, let's see, 2018. Yeah. We, 2018, my planting conditions were really ideal. Um, that single row planter is not very heavy and doesn't really have good depth control. So when we planted the, the trial that you saw data from, it all went in the ground nicely and germinated nicely and we had good stands, but those um, mixed row versus alternating rows that we planted next door going just a week or 10 days later, the surface had dried out enough um, that the chickpea just didn't get deep enough. And so there was a very poor chickpea stand there. Um, and I ended up not, not collecting data on it. Um, I think, <laughs> sorry for rambling, but I think I'll probably defer to Lena who has better data on that. Um, just to my limited observation in 2018, um, I don't recall um, as pronounced differences in Ascochyta between say monocrop chickpea and um, the intercropped, or sorry, monocrop chickpea versus uh, chickpea and flax either in the same row or alternating row in those uh, strips that I put out. But my, my issue there is there were just very few chickpea plants in, in both places. So I don't really have a good read on that. Um, my sense is that alternating rows would have an advantage for ascochyta control. Again, knowing that, that row spacing and, you know, if we're, uh, yeah, the, that row spacing can have an impact on ascochyta incidence in monocrop chickpea than I would expect if you can have essentially an architecture where you're putting lots of barriers between chickpea plants. So in the case of my 2020 trial, where you have row of chickpea, two rows of flax, row of chickpea, two rows of flax, um, certainly, you know, in that same chickpea row, there's, there's contact between leaves, but you're putting barriers there side to side that would help limit physical spread. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly, um, defer to Lena as I think she's, um, played with that more, more than I have. And, and I will say, you know, it, it is a trade-off because, um, you know, it, again, when you're doing these intercrop, you're usually picking two crops that have very different seed sizes. And so, you know, of course the big advantage of alternating is that you can set each row to plant the crop exactly where it likes to be planted. When you do a mixed row, you have to do something in between in most cases. And so you're usually planting your small seeded crop deeper than you would normally plant. Your big seeded crop shallower than you normally plant. Uh, so the conditions have to be um, a little more sensitive when you're doing the mixed row. Yeah, and Mike, um, there's a, another question in the chat that's a good follow-up to that. Uh, question for Mike. Since you seeded in the same row, did you go at the full chickpea seeding depth or shallow up somewhere in between? So yeah, when we do our chickpea flax, um, I think we usually target about an inch and a quarter. Um, and then uh, when we do our field pea canola, we usually put it right around an inch or maybe just slightly more. Um, and you know, usually we've found that the smaller seeded crop comes up easier if it's in the mixed row because uh, you know, it does have that large seeded crop to help it get out of the ground. So you do have some synergy there. Um, but, you know, 
if, if you're worried about the moisture conditions though, um, you know, and, and you have different things to plant, I would definitely be planting your mixed row intercrop at the right timing for, for what your soil moisture is. Um, I, I would say that much at least. 